<clears throat> okay. Any questions about anything before we start? No? No, seriously, are there prelims this week that you guys have? All right. Well, I'll try not to take it personally that there's a lot of people watching at home. But Comp Arc? But how big is the intersection of the t the, these classes? Hmm. Oh, well. OK. Well, anyway, we'll still do class, even if we don't have a lot of people. All right, so we were talking about the DTFT, discrete time Fourier transform, and today I want to continue that a little bit, and then I want to segue into discussing sampling, interpolation, those kinds of ideas, and it's going to be a significantly deeper level than we did in 2200. But anyway, we say that a complex valued signal discrete time signal, so x and c to the z, and a 2 pi periodic function, x hat, and it's going to be a function of a real variable little omega, are a DTFT pair, when one or both these equations holds and the equation that gives you x hat from x is this one it's a sum and we call it equation DTFT x hat of little omega is the sum over all n of x of n e to the minus j n omega for all omega in the reals And the one that gives you x of n in terms of x out of omega is the inverse DTFT equation. And what I'm going to have to do here is I brought my own blister mitigation device here, which works better than Band-Aids, actually. This adhesive tape. Uh-oh, there's only like two turns left. Well, that should be enough. Yeah, see, a new blister started north of Nathan's Band-Aid here, so still the same Band-Aid, by the way. Lasted through the shower this morning. Yeah. Do you have any more with you, by the way? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Okay. X of n is equal to 1 over 2 pi times the integral from minus pi to pi, x hat of omega, e to the positive, j n omega d omega, and that's for all n in the integers. And last time we showed that delta, so x of n equals delta of n, is a DTFT pair with x hat of omega equals 1. That's really easy to show. And that notation double arrow with a DTFT above it is, is the same as or is the, this, the discrete time version of the double arrow with the F above it in continuous time. And now what I'd like to do is talk about accommodating deltas over in omega space. Remember, in discrete time, the signal delta is not a problem. It's a true signal. Unlike in continuous time where delta isn't really a signal, it's something else. We have to deal with it with special techniques. But in discrete time, we can just plug in the signal x of n equals delta m n in formula DTFT, and we get that for x hat of omega. But what about, what about a delta in omega space? So how about deltas in omega space? So for example, how about Say you have x hat of omega equals 2 pi delta of omega minus some little omega 0. 
That's an example of a delta in omega space. And it's kind of like delta of omega minus capital omega zero in continuous time with a 2 pi in front of it. First off, why is that, that exact thing, not a DTFT? What's missing? 2 pi periodic. A DTFT has to be 2 pi periodic. This can't be a DTFT. Because it's not 2 pi periodic in omega. So what do we do? Let's just extend it 2 pi periodically. Let's just add all the 2 pi shifts of that thing over all k being how many times you shift by 2 pi. So let's extend it periodically. to a new x out of omega, which is this. x out of omega is equal to the sum over all k. And I'm going to have a 2 pi in front of this. Well, let's keep the 2 pi with the deltas. Just the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of delta of omega minus omega 0 plus 2 pi k. I'll just put it as k 2 pi. Now, that is a periodic thing. That's a 2 pi periodic thing. So it could conceivably be a DTFT of something. And it sure enough turns out to be. What is the form of this? This, this takes the form of an impulse train, as they call it. So this x hat is an impulse train. So people call it in omega space. Where do the impulses happen? The impulses happen <coughs> and I'll put the word happen in quotes because when we're talking about time functions, we always talk about impulses occurring at time so and so. And occur has this very temporable feel to it. And so I'm just going to say happen. They happen at the following frequencies. Omega zero. And that corresponds with k equals 0. Omega 0 plus and minus 2 pi. That corresponds to k equals plus or minus 1. Omega 0 plus or minus 4 pi, etc. OK? And if you represent that impulse train schematically, and you really can't graph an impulse. From, and you know, I, f I forget, when we talked about the time impulses, did I show you how people graph them with a big arrow, big thick arrow pointing up? Did I show you that? OK. Well, last year. Last year. Yeah, but not this year, right? Eh? So, so let me see if I can find an appropriately small piece of chalk to work with here. If not, we'll make do. Yes, this is good. Not much smaller, but let's graph this thing versus omega at least schematically represent it. So here's going to be the omega axis. And this is going to be x hat of omega. And say omega 0 is out here somewhere. And suppose, say, suppose this is, this is um, say, 2 pi. This is pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, 6 pi, and so on. And this would be 7 pi. And then I have a minus pi over here, minus 2 pi over here, minus 3 pi, and so on. You're going to have an impulse right at omega 0. And you're going to have an impulse at omega 0 plus 2 pi. So if this is 8 pi, and this is 9 pi. Then omega 0 plus 2 pi is going to be about here. And omega 0 minus 2 pi. It's going to be about here. And omega 0 minus 4 pi is going to be about here. Omega 0 minus 6 pi is going to be about here. And then there's one over here. <coughs> and so on. That's where they're going to happen. So you can see they're kind of arrayed out in omega space that way. 
Notice that there's exactly one, provided this omega 0 doesn't happen at an odd multiple of 2 pi. So provided omega 0 is not equal to an odd multiple of pi, say 3 pi, 5 pi, 7 pi, whatever, exactly one impulse. happens in the interval minus pi up to pi in omega space. And you can, you can see why that's true. There's no way to shift by 2 pi starting in the interval minus pi to pi and stay in the interval minus pi to pi. You land in there once for one particular k value. So let's call it, say, k0 or k star. So it's going to be omega 0 minus k star times 2 pi. That happens in the interval minus pi to pi. Now what happens when we plug this impulse train into equation dtft inverse? What happens is because dtft inverse, that, that equation, wherever it is up there, captures only omega between minus pi and pi, it ignores all these impulses except for the one in there. So you plug x hat into equation dtft inverse. And what happens? You get <coughs> integral from minus pi to pi with the 2 pi in front <coughs> times 2 pi just that single delta, the delta of omega 0 minus, or omega minus omega 0 plus k two k star times 2 pi, e to the j and omega d omega. This is a 1 over out here. The 2 pi's cancel, and what happens when you have a delta times an e is you just plug in whatever is subtracted from omega in for little omega and you get this. You get e to the j n parentheses omega 0 minus k star times 2 pi. And because k star is an integer and k star is also an integer, e to the j times integer multiple 2 pi is 1. So that makes no difference and you just get e to the j n omega 0 for all n. So the conclusion is that the signal x with specification So the signal x, the specification x of n equals e to the j n omega 0 for all n has dtft x hat. Now I need to go to a bigger piece of chalk. specification x hat of omega is equal to the sum over all k 2 pi delta of omega minus omega 0 plus k times 2 pi. So that's how deltas arise in the omega domain. And this is true for all omega, 0. So this is true for all poorest possible choices of omega 0. It could be negative, could be positive, could be between minus pi and pi, could be way out, like that picture up there. It could be 10 to the 59th. It would be easier if it were 2 pi <coughs> times 10 to the 59th, but whatever. The name for that signal x, a signal x of that kind, we call that a 
discrete time complex exponential sinusoid of frequency omega zero. And I want to caution you once again that this little omega variable meaning frequency, it doesn't have to do with the frequency of the values of x. Like x of n, thinking of it a bunch of complex numbers, is not going to be a periodic sequence of numbers in general. So anyway, so terminology, this x is called a complex, a discrete time complex, I'm putting more abbreviations than usual on the board, I hope it doesn't bother you, exponential sinusoid of frequency omega zero. And those are going to play a role in the discrete time system, similar to the role that e to the j omega zero t type signals played for continuous time systems. Okay, so, so much for examples of DTFTs. And just a few words, not every signal has a DTFT. Not every function of omega, even a 2 pi periodic function of omega is a DTFT of a signal. If you have a decent 2 pi periodic function of omega, that will always be the DTFT of something. You just plug it into equation DTFT inverse and out pops a discrete time signal. If you have a t finite duration signal, say, finite duration, time signal, that is always going to have a DTFT. If you have an L1 signal, it's always going to have a DTFT. And there's an L2 theory associated with it as well. And there's, you know, a Plancherel, Parseval kind of thing going on, just as we had for Fourier series, just as we had for continuous time Fourier transforms. All that stuff is in the monograph, but we're not going to dwell on that in class. Okay, so there's a couple, there's many, as there are for continuous time Fourier transforms, there's a whole litany of operational rules for these discrete time Fourier transforms. And I'm only going to mention two of them because those are the two that we use the most. So among many operational rules for the DTFT, two stand out. Oh, and also, also again, uh, another thing I'm not going to lay the labor in class, but we talked about more in continuous time. You want to extend the definition of this by linearity. So you cover signals that have um, maybe deltas and a smooth thing together in the frequency domain, whatever. It's not, it's so neither one equation might hold, the other doesn't, whatever. It's all very natural. First one is the time shift rule. And what does that say? That says that if x has DTFT x hat, then for any time shift, for any n0 in the integers, the signal y You know what's pretty astounding? Actually, this just occurred to me. It, this, this adhesive tape that I have with me, I took this to college with me as a freshman, just in case I needed adhesive tape. And it's just now running out. How about that? 43 years later, it's just now running out. That's pretty good. Eh? Like, I wish there were a copyright date on here so I could prove it to you. But unfortunately, there isn't. That's really useful stuff. You know, it, it's. It's kind of like personal duct tape, you know? Like you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to put duct tape on your finger. No, you don't want to do that because you can literally rip the skin right off. But you wouldn't want to put that on a duct. It would just melt. So anyway, if x has DTFT x hat, then the signal y equals shift sub n zero of x has DTFT y hat with specification y hat of omega equals e to the minus 
j n zero omega x hat of omega for all omega. And that's easy to prove from equation DTFT inverse or equation DTFT. Proof is in the monograph, it's like two lines long. That's supposed to look like the time shift rule for continuous time Fourier transforms. There, remember, we had capital omegas. And instead of this term here, we had e to the minus j capital omega t0. So n0 is playing the role that t0 played for that one. And guess what the other rule is that I want to mention? Convolution, Convolution rule, yeah. You know that? If, if anyone has a gun to your head and they're talking transforms, not, not that this happens frequently, <laughs> but it, it happens only rarely that someone will have a gun to your head. And they'll say, uh, what operational rule am I going to tell you about? Alex is right to guess uh, convolutional. Because for every transform, there's a convolution rule. That's one of the morals of signals and systems. So that's the convolution rule. It goes like this. If x and y are signals with respective DTFTs, x hat and y hat, and their convolution exists, or actually let me use x1 and x2 instead of y. So let's make this x2. This is hard to concentrate both on what you're saying and on writing with a painful hand. But anyway, I don't want to whine, so I'll quit. If, those, if two signals, x1 and x2, have respective DTFTs, x1 hat and x2 hat, and x1 convolved with x2 exists, then x1 convolved with x2 is also going to have a DTFT. And surprise, surprise, it's just the product of x1 hat with x2 hat, ordinary functional multiplication. So convolution rule looks just like it does for any other transform you would encounter. And the convolution rule, as you might expect, helps us understand how the DTFT is relevant to discrete time LTI systems, right? Because inputs convolve without, with impulse response to give you outputs and so on. OK, so that's what I want to turn to next. And that is this whole idea of DTFTs and discrete time LTI systems. And this is going to be a brief, speedy discussion because the ideas here are essentially identical to the ideas in continuous time. OK, suppose you're given a system. And when I say system, I just mean discrete time LTI system. We sit with system mapping S. Well, I'm not even going to do that. Given a system with impulse response H, <coughs> we say that the system has a frequency response when When every complex exponential sinusoid for every possible frequency, so every signal in the form x of n equals e to the j n omega 0, so every discrete time complex exponential sinusoid is in script d sub h. Remember what that is? That's the set of all signals, discrete time signals, convolvable with H. And that's the set of admissible inputs for this discrete time system. 
And this definition of having a frequency response is exactly the same as the definition of having a frequency response in continuous time, except we're talking about discrete time complex exponential sinusoids rather than continuous ones, continuous time ones. So if a system has a frequency response, so say the system. say a system has a frequency response, consider what happens when you drive the system with input x with specification x of n equals e to the j and say omega 1 for some omega 1 in the reals. We're allowed to do that because the system has a frequency response so every signal of that form is okay as an input. The output y or s of x at time n is just going to be h convolved with x at time n for all n. Let's plug in what h convolved with x is. It's the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of h of k x of n minus k. And if you plug in what x of n minus k is, sum over k, h of k, e to the j, n minus k, omega 1. I can factor an e to the j n omega 1 out of that expression because it doesn't depend on the variable summation and you get this. Sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, h of k, e to the minus j k, omega 1, all that times e to the j n omega 1. The thing in parentheses is a number that depends on omega 1. It's not a function of n. It's not a function of anything. It's just a number that depends on omega 1. And so what we've seen is that we, if we drive the system with one of these pure complex exponential sinusoids, we get as the output a pure complex exponential sinusoid of the same frequency, omega 1, whose amplitude is scaled by this thing in parentheses. Thus, x's of this form are eigeninputs for the system, just like in continuous time. Continuous time sinusoids were eigeninputs for the systems. And the eigenvalue associated with the eigeninput is the thing in parentheses. So thus such x, such an x, any such x is an quote unquote eigeninput. with, quote unquote, eigenvalue, the number in parentheses. So it's playing out just as it did in continuous time. Parentheses, and there's an R in here. If you consider letting this omega 1 vary over all omega, you get a function of omega, the eigenvalue is a function of omega, the thing in parentheses is a function of omega. So you let omega 1 vary over omega, you get a function of omega, 
which I'm going to call for obvious reasons h hat of omega because it is, as you look at it, you can see it's just the dtft of the impulse response. The only difference is that here we have a sum over k rather than a sum over n. Same thing. It's just a dummy variable sum of, in, of summation. This function is called the system's frequency response, and evidently it's the DTFT of the impulse response H. <coughs> so H hat is called the system's frequency response and clearly it's the DTFT even though we didn't derive it using DTFTs we derived it by plugging in an e to the j and omega kind of thing and figuring out what the eigenvalue associated with that eigen input was clearly it's the DTFT of the impulse response little h. So if you have a system that has a frequency response, you have two ways you can figure it out. So again, as in continuous time, and I sound like a broken record every time I say that, but a broken record sounds better than a digital skip on a CD. It may not sound cooler, but it sounds better. Has anyone ever had an MRI, been in an MRI machine? I hear that noise as music, kind of, as like industrial, do you at all? Not really, okay. You fall asleep, okay. No, I, I have, I've had it, my back MRI a couple times, and um, it's really loud in there, you know? They don't give me, they didn't give me music at Cuba Medical Center, they just gave me headphones to blot out the noise, but the noise sounded like music to me. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Anyway, as in continuous time, uh, I don't know how I thought of MRIs there, why did I think of MRIs? Oh, broken record. Yes, 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 okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, as in continuous time, uh, you can figure out a system's frequency response, provided it has one, in at least two ways. One way is to plug in the signal e to the j and omega and see what comes out. That's always going to be h hat of omega times e to the j and omega. So that's one way is to take x of n equals e to the j and omega for all n. Put that into the system, measure the output and you're going to have s of x of n equals h hat of omega e to the j n omega for all n. And depending on how the system is presented to you, this might be the easiest way to do it. Or take the DTFT of the system's impulse response h. And if someone comes up to you on the street and gives you the impulse response, doesn't present you in the system in a way that's easy to figure out the first way, you do it that way. <coughs> okay. All right, so anyway, 
The frequency response tells us at least how the system operates on pure discrete time sinusoids. If the value at omega 1 of the frequency response is big, then it amplifies the sinusoidal frequency omega 1. If it's small, it attenuates it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But it also is going to tell us how it modifies the frequency or content of arbitrary inputs that happen to have DTFTs. And so that's the one last thing I want to do about systems. So why don't we take the three minute break and then we'll do that and then move on to the sampling stuff. And if there's anyone here who still hasn't picked up his or her prelim, do I have your attention? <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's giving me a hard time. All right, so anyway, anyway, as in continuous time, not only does the frequency response tell you how the system messes with pure sinusoids, it tells you how it messes with arbitrary inputs that have DTFTs. So for a more general x, so for more general inputs x in d sub h, Okay, so x is something in d sub h that have Fourier transforms, DTFTs. We have the following. <coughs> S of x, being h can evolve with x, as always, is going to have DTFT. S of x hat, I'll put a hat over the whole S of x, equals h hat x hat. That's true because of the convolution rule. And if you think of x hat as, in some sense, telling you about the frequency content of x, whatever that might mean for a discrete time signal, you see that the frequency response reshapes, messes, whatever, with that frequency content to give you the frequency content of the output. So thus, as in continuous time, we should have an abbreviation for this, AICT, you know, something like that. H hat sort of describes So H hat describes how the system quote unquote molds whatever the frequency content of the input embodied in X hat to get the frequency content of the output. And I could go on and talk about ideal discrete time filters, ideal low pass, ideal high pass, ideal band pass. I'm not going to do that until maybe later on. But, but for now, I, I just wanted to you know, give you the quick intro to DTFTs because DTFTs are the way that we do a sort of a rigor, rigorous approach to sampling and interpolation and stuff. So any questions about this? It makes, it makes a lot of sense if you just think of it in the context of continuous time stuff, generalizing it to discrete time. So we're good on that. Okay. So the next thing I want to do is I want to talk about 
and this is a really important collection of topics. <coughs> this whole circle of ideas around sampling and interpolation. And of course the highlights are going to be various versions of the Shannon, Shannon Nyquist sampling theorem, which is a hugely important result. As you know, you've heard me talk about it last year in various contexts. And it turns out, actually, it's something I only learned recently when I was studying the wavelet stuff for, for the wavelet part of the class. You can actually interpret the sampling theorem in a wavelet kind of way. And when I revise this chapter, I'm going to try to throw that in at the end. But I, I don't want to go there right now. So sampling and interpolation, what's that all about? Discrete time signals, some signals are discrete time just by their very nature. They just come at you that way. You know, like the record of things that were in a shift register in a computer, and time doesn't really have a necessarily a meaning. It depends on the clock speed of the computer, whatever. But sometimes discrete time signals come from sampling continuous time signals. So sometimes, but by no means always, and it's always good not to sort of have a, have a mental image all the time of every discrete time signal as having come from a continuous time signal. I think that's a bad way to think. Well, it's not a helpful way to think. Let's put it that way. Sometimes, by no means always, discrete time signal x arises from sampling a continuous time signal and here for this part of the course I'm going to just to emphasize that we're dealing with a continuous time signal in one case and a not continuous time signal in the other case I'm going to put a subscript x sub c, a subscript sub c on the continuous time signal. Okay? And to be precise about that, so more precisely given, and again let's just assume for, for the purposes of exposition that all the signals we're talking about are complex valued, so given x sub c, a complex value continuous time signal, and some given capital T bigger than zero, we can form a signal x by sampling x of c at integer multiples of capital T. So we can form x in c to the z by means of the prescription x of n is equal to x of c of n t for all n in the integers. Now clearly, if you take a continuous time signal, it's a whole continuum of values, and you sample it at a discrete set of points, you're throwing away lots of information about the signal. So ostensibly at least, without further assumptions, x of n contains very little information about x sub c in it. So note, a priori, x contains rather limited info about x sub c. <coughs> okay, so that's one thing. And you know, you can call it, you can call x a t sampled version of x or a t set or f x sub c or a t sampled x. And schematically, the way x arises from x is it goes through something I call a t sampler. Fair enough, right? T sampling is a linear operation on signals, and you can think of it as a mapping from C to the R into C to the Z. So you can view this, the quote unquote T sampling process as a linear mapping from 
c to the r to c to the z. Okay, now here's a question for you. Here's a picture I'll often put down. X goes into a box. So this is an ideal T sampler. This is X of C. And out comes X. Okay, so viewed as a mapping, viewed as a mapping, a linear mapping from a vector space of signals to another one. Is this a surjective mapping, first off, the T sampling process? You nod vigorously. Denzel, how come? Um, because every spot in X is filled by some value from X of C. Okay, good start. The, the, the thing is, we have to say, if, if someone comes up to you on the street and gives you a discrete time complex valued signal and says, here, is there a continuous time signal for which this is the T sample version? Can you find such a thing? Does every discrete time signal arise from sampling some continuous time signal every t seconds? How many people think yes? Two. How many people think no? The cameraman thinks no. <laughs> OK. Actually, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy to see, sorry folks who said no, um, that if you draw a bunch of dots, like every t. So someone comes up to you on the street, so this is t equals cap t, 2t, 3t, and so on. And someone says, here's a discrete time signal. So it has a value this at time n equals 0, value this at time n equals 1, value this at time n equals 2, and so on. This at time n equals 3. I can get that signal, that discrete time signal, by t sampling any continuous time signal that passes through those dots, right? And there are such things, like I could do this, right? Or I could do this. Well, plenty of things. So this mapping is surjective. But it's not injective. That's the key. It's not injective. Many different continuous time signals, x sub c, give rise to the same t-sampled signal x. So it's not injective. Okay, so how does this go? How does this go? You think of x discrete time signal x as a bunch of dots. You can always connect those dots somehow in a functional kind of way. So we can connect those dots, in fact, in many ways. To get a continuous time signal, Let's call it x sub c such that x of c at integer multiples of cap t equals x of n for all integers n. And the fact that we can always connect the dots to get an x of c, that says the mapping is surjective. The fact that we could do it in many ways says the mapping is not injective. So let me just give you some examples, just a few. So suppose you had these are the dots. And I'll try not to write boring dots anyway. So let's put same dots over here. This is minus t, t, 2t. And think of it as going out like that. Another one up here, here, here. Same set of dots. OK, so here's one way to connect the dots. You can do it in a nice, smooth kind of thing like this, right? That's one signal that interpolates the dots, right? You could do it linearly, say, like that. Or, you know, if you're like me, you'd be very perverse and do it this way, 
Those are all ways of connecting the dots. Those are all continuous time signals x sub c that satisfy that relation. x sub c of nt equals x of n for all n. Any such way of connecting the dots is called a t interpolation of discrete time signal x. So interpolation in some sense is the inverse operation of sampling. So if I'm given x in c to the z, any x of c in c to the r, for which x of n equals x of c of nt for all n, is called a t interpolation. of x. Given a continuous time signal and a sampling interval t, there's only one t-sampled version of x, one discrete time signal that comes out by doing that. But given a discrete time signal, there's zillions of continuous time signals that lead to the same discrete time signal x. OK. All right. Now, you've all heard me talk, you know, you heard, although last year, the ones who took 2200 last year, you heard the whole spiel about the movies, right, with the wheel turning in the movies. Usually I do that in class, but I'm not going to do it this semester. You could read about it in the monograph. But just to, just to mention for those of you who weren't around last semester, when you watch a movie, you know, you see a wheel turning, and sometimes it sort of hovers, and sometimes it goes backwards. You know, it's not doing the right thing. Alex, you never saw that before? What's that? I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I always think about back to Western movies where with the big stage coaches, you know, those big spoked wheels, you know. Those are really good examples of this. Anyway, when you take a movie, when you film a movie, what's happening in front of the camera is a continuous time visual signal, right? What the camera does is it, it basically strobes that signal. It takes 24 frames per second of that continuous time visual signal. That corresponds to a sampling interval capital T equals 1 24th of a second. And that's the movie. The movie is a whole bunch of still pictures. The X, so to speak, is the movie. The X sub C is the scene you're filming. And a Hollywood movie is filmed at 24 frames per second. And depending on how fast, say, a wheel is turning, when you strobe it like that, when you take pictures 24 frames a second, the wheel could, be, could look like, in the film, look as if it were standing still, like if, you took, if it were turning exactly 24 revs per second. Or it could, look, it could be turning to the right in real life, but in the film it would look as if it were turning backward. You know, all kinds of things can happen. Okay? And those are examples of the fact that in real life, you had one X sub C that gave rise to those samples. When you film it and then watch it, your mind builds another X sub C that matches those samples. That's different from the one that was filmed. So watching a movie is an example of generating sometimes a different T interpolation of the samples than the signal that was actually filmed. Okay? And I talk about that a little bit more in the monograph, if you want to read about it. But you all heard me talk about you know, watching The Modern Farmer on TV with my brother at 6 a.m. on Saturday, you know, blah, blah, blah. You heard that whole thing. So, and if you want to watch that spiel, by the way, look at the video notes from fall 2011. And actually, in the annotation for the video notes, it says, the reason I know this is because I had to show my brother. It says, in one of the lectures, it says, Professor talks about watching Modern Farmer on TV as child, or something like that. You know? <laughs> so so if, you want to, if you want to hear that, that piece of the lecture, which I'm going to skip, then you can look at that video note. All right, so here's a question. Now we know, we know all about T sampling. We know all about T interpolation as big general ideas. Here's a question. Suppose I have a continuous time signal xc that has a Fourier transform. 
So given xc in c to the r, say xc has Fourier transform, and remember, this is a continuous time Fourier transform, xc hat. So that's a description of the frequency content of the continuous time signal xc. <coughs> Let x be a t sample version. So given t bigger than 0, define x in c to the n, or c to the integers, by x of n equals x of c of n t for all n. That is to say, x is, quote unquote, t sampled x sub c. <coughs> OK. Now here's a question for you. Suppose I have a continuous time signal that has a continuous time Fourier transform, and I sample it every capital T and to get a discrete time signal. Is that discrete time signal automatically going to have a DTFT? Or is it possible that it might not? It's a non-trivial question. What's that? Does what have to be two pi periodic? Um, the sample that we plug into the DTFT. No, no, it doesn't. It, it's it. okay. It turns out that X need not have a DTFT. But it usually does. Okay. <laughs> and what are sufficient conditions for x to have a DTFT? If, for example, x sub c is band limited, that's one. Or x sub c is an L2 signal that's band limited. You know, all, all those kind of, there's all kinds of sufficient conditions. And to dream up an example where x doesn't have a DTFT, you have to think pretty hard. Okay. So let's assume it does. Assuming it does, <coughs> suppose that x has DTFT x hat. I wonder, we wonder how, if any at all, that x hat is related to x of c hat. So how is x hat related? to x sub c hat. How is the dt ft of a t sampled x, a lot of t's floating around here, related to the continuous time Fourier transform of the continuous time signal it samples, if at all? And obviously, we, I wouldn't be sort of belaboring this question and drawing it out in this kind of boring way if there weren't an interesting answer. OK, so it turns out that there's a nice relationship. And here's the fact. And I give this sort of a, a comical name. It's, it's supposed to be funny, you know. But if you don't know anything about literary criticism, it won't be funny to you. OK, so this is called the, the equation we're going to get is called the deconstruction equation. OK, so how does it go? Given x in c, x sub c in c to the r, and t bigger than 0, and x formed as above, namely a t sampled version of x sub c, it turns out that whenever x has a dtft x hat, it's given by the following formula. 
So when x has a DTFT, x hat, x hat has specification, and I'm going to call this equation D for deconstruction, x hat of little omega equals the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of 1 over t xc hat of omega over t plus k 2 pi over t for all things. Now this is kind of ugly. But I'm going to describe how to implement that equation. I'm not going to prove it in class. It's, it's just a matter of manipulating integrals and changing variables and all that kind of stuff. But I do want to emphasize the following. Note, we've made no assumptions about x sub c except that it has a continuous time Fourier transform and that the t sample version has a DTFT. This is true regardless of whether x sub c is band limited regardless of what the bandwidth is, if it is band limited. So this is true. Equation D holds generally, or let me, let me, in general, all caps, no assumption about, for example, band limitedness of x sub c or anything like that. <coughs> okay, so that's the deconstruction equation. Okay, so how do you, one way to think about implementing it, so the proof is in the monograph, and one way to, to implement it, to figure out xc x hat from xc hat, I like to think of it as a two-step process. So think about, quote unquote, implementing it. as a two-step process. First step is you take x sub c, the continuous time Fourier x sub c hat, the continuous time Fourier transform of x sub c, and form f hat as follows. And I forget whether I call it f or f hat in the monograph. I think I might just call it f, so let's call it f. If anyone has monograph open, you could tell me, that would be great. So f of omega is going to be the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of xc hat of capital omega plus k 2 pi over t. And this is for all omega. And when we go through a couple of examples of doing this, you'll see what's going on here. What it, you, can, you, can, you can tell analytically what's going on here. What you're doing is you're taking x c hat of omega and you're looking at all of the shifts of it by multiples of 2 pi over t in either direction and adding those all together. So it's a sum of shifted replicas of x c hat. That's what f of omega is and that's step one. Step two is 
do a rescaling of f in both amplitude and argument. by 1 over t, and you get x hat of little omega, this is the dtft of the t-sample version of x, equals 1 over t f of little omega over t, equals the sum over all k, 1 over t xc hat of little omega over t, plus k 2 pi over t for all omega. So that's a two-step implementation. And some people call the second step frequency normalization, whatever. I, I, I mean, I don't call it anything. I just do that. You know, just do it. OK, so that's one way to think about implementing equation D. Let's look at an example. Let's look at a quick, quick example. And this might look familiar to some of you. <laughs> The thing that's different about it is we're actually dealing with DTFTs. <coughs> so for example, say that this is what XC hat of omega looks like. Looks like a triangle, say, like so. Okay. What happens when I form F? So let's pick T. And form F. How do I form F? I shift XC hat by all possible integer multiples of 2 pi over T in both directions. And I add all those shifted replicas together. One of two things can happen. Here's one. This could happen. Here's the k equals 0 shift of xc hat. And here's 2 pi over t. And that's the k equals 1 shift, or k equals minus 1, actually. This is 4 pi over t. And actually, that would be farther out than that. So it's more like this. And so on. And over here, you're going to have one at minus 2 pi over t. Right? <coughs> that could happen. Or something else could happen. Now, what is the tacit assumption I've made here for this picture to be what happens when I do the F formation? Remember, each replica is centered 2 pi over t away from its adjacent partners. Right? Manish. Yeah, 2 pi over t has to be big enough so that this triangle doesn't hit this triangle. That's it. This triangle doesn't hit this triangle. So that's a constraint on smallness of t. t has to be really small for 2 pi over t to be big. Okay. And the other thing that can happen is if t isn't small enough for those things not to hit. And anyway, so let's pick it up next time, and we'll continue with this. Please.